morning. Good morning. See that lovely garden. We spent hours on that. Hours getting that grass cut. Let's go the windy bends because we've got plenty of time. I've set the time right on the um, webcam dash cam. So it was wrong the other day. Looking really old today. Dear me. No traffic around. It's a funny thing, isn't it? I suppose there's no. Uh... Let me just get that right. Let me just turn the blower off in case you're getting any blower sound. I'll try and put a bit more thought into the sound on these these days. How are you? All right. Well, I trust. We're all uh, fit and healthy, the angry family. They're all going down to a beach hut today. I'm going to uh, work this morning and then I've got a uh, gonna go and meet a friend of mine. Uh, he's flying to somewhere and I'm flying in to meet him. We do it every one, two or three weeks, you know, in the summer. So that's exciting. I don't think it's somewhere I've flown in before, Stapleford. A busy aerodrome, northeast corner of the M25. Uh, you know, well located for. Problem with um, flying into airfields is most of them require that you get permission before you land. And uh, it's a bit like uh, deciding to go around the M25 or the M2 or the M6 or whatever, and then um, not being able to stop at a service station unless you've literally rung them beforehand and got permission. And uh, you can't ring them while you're driving or flying. You have to uh, ring them from a ground line. So in effect, you have to do it before you set off. And they will, in principle, refuse even though they could say yes, if you try and ask them for permission, you know, en route, because um, they just want to uphold this principle of uh, everybody having to um, ask in advance, and not they don't want to deal with a load of requests on the fly from people that they don't really know, you know, they can't assess. They've got to say yes or no quickly, they've got no time to think about it. So what they want is they want you to ask them in advance so they can have a few, a minute to consider whether or not they want you there. Whether you've got a history with them of doing things wrong or you're a type of aircraft that they don't like because you're too noisy or and every airfield has bylaws which apply to uh, number of takeoffs and landings and type of aircraft that can fly in and out, hours of operation, etc, etc, etc. So, it's, um, it's, not, it's a good flying today, fun. it's a good flying day, although I don't know whether you can see that from the clouds. There's a bit of low cumulus and some higher um, Cumulus, I think that is, and so it'll be good. It's what we call visual meteorological conditions. So I'll be able to fly under the visual flight rules, which is basically see and be seen. So stay out of cloud. Make sure you've got a decent visibility forwards, and uh, it should be no trouble at all. Also, it's not too hot. Um, people think that you might want to fly, that the warmer the better. But in fact, yeah, as you, uh, air gets hotter, it gets less dense. And uh, planes don't fly well. In less dense air, they tend to struggle a bit more. The wings work best when the air is pretty dense. And uh, 
So like recently in that 40 degrees day, it, it would, that would probably be the worst day for flying. Um, not to say that planes couldn't fly in that, they probably could, but um, you'd have to go to the textbook and have a look and just check, you know, what, what sort of weight you've got on board and what your, what your uh, clearances are, you know, on the runways and stuff like that. So, what's going on in the surgery? Well, we had a young lady who uh, was having a lot of trouble with a wisdom tooth, toothache, and uh, we referred her to the oral surgeons, and they were being so slow about taking it out that uh, we decided to take it out, or at least we thought we could take it out for her and um, unfortunately the top half came out the bottom half didn't come out so she's no better off except that at least we have we have attempted to try and get her out of pain but I haven't really succeeded and in the meantime it's what's it now about the 28th of uh, and we referred her on the 6th or the 7th so she's still not at an appointment so it's very difficult isn't it difficult to know what to do for patients like that obviously if we give them antibiotics that's uh, and I've you know instructed on how to use painkillers alternate paracetamol and, and uh, ibuprofen uh, not exceeding the stated dose can alternate those every two hours but uh, there's not really much of a solution for a painful wisdom tooth I'll just stick behind this guy because this is one of the sharpest curves can't see around him so although I can now so we did um, uh, some fillings on a little girl yesterday she was five years eight months I think when we started five years ten months part of being a generalist that you have to uh, you know take wisdom teeth out or try to anyway and uh, also uh, make dentures and do fillings on five-year-olds now let's talk a bit about pediatric dentistry now that the uh, thing about pediatric in a way the younger the child the better you know I'd rather do fillings on a five-year-old than on an eight-year-old or a ten-year-old or a fourteen-year-old, as we did recently. Um, the children aren't uh, corrupted in terms of being nervous of the dentist unless they're corrupted by either the dentist or the parents. Now, of those two, the dentist is the one that's capable of causing the most damage because uh, you're not going to put yourself in the care of someone who's hurt you in the past. And five years don't have much uh, logical thought, so basically they're just like, this hurt in the past, therefore I don't want it. You can't reason with a five-year-old and say, if you don't have this done, you'll be in more pain in the future, because they don't care about the future. They don't quite understand the concept of the future or the uh, stitch in time and all that. So they'll just like, no, I didn't like this, I don't like this, I'm not having it done. So it's very important that you, um, you know, you know uh, how to push things without uh, causing distress. Um, I'll give you an example. There you go. Obviously, you, you make sure that the injections are painless by using the finest needle that you've got and and uh, using a topical local anaesthetic beforehand and injecting really slowly, drop at a time, which our electronic injection machine is very good at. 
So, um, also, um, like for example, if a five-year-old's having three fillings done, they're, they're going to have trouble keeping their mouth open after about 15 minutes, and so it is, it is acceptable, uh, providing you do it gently and in a sympathetic way, just to grab hold of the jaw and push it down so it opens up, you know. I mean, I think that they won't object to that. In many ways, it's, it's sort of helpful because they can't do, I think they, they do want to do, they do want to keep their mouth open, but after a while their mouth just, just shut, you know. So I always get the kids to look up, put their heads right back, like you're gonna do CPR on them, because that way their mouth just naturally does get open wider. Anyway, we, um, once, once they're numb, you know, you can go through all the usual, uh, Sort of procedures of doing fillings, including using the air rotor and high volume aspirator, and also using the um, slow hand piece. And I tend to use an inverted cone burst for that because um, basically you want you want all the decay to fly out, and an inverted cone is is best at that. You can remove decay with an inverted cone by sort of almost using it as a round burst. And secondly, um, you want to put some undercuts in underneath the enamel at the same time because uh, next thing you know, you're going to be whacking and filling in, aren't you? So you can do all the bonding and everything if you want. Put composite in. That's probably a bit overkill. You can uh, just uh, repair the cavity and uh, dry it out and then slap some chem fill in, which is probably, I would say, in the context of general practice, uh, a better practice, because at the end of the day, you only want to preserve these D's and E's until they fall out. And uh, even before they fall out, their uh, roots are going to start dissolving. So really, you've only got like a few years at the most for these fillings to need to last. Um, and that that applies with um, anterior teeth as well. You know, we had a B upper left B which had a distal incisal cavity and we'll put a put chemfil in that and give it a bit of a corner and you know at the end of the day the, the, the child's got a cute smile anyway just doesn't have a sharp broken tooth at the front and they were spacing out you know so it's quite obvious that the front teeth were going to come through fairly soon then you've got on the other hand you've got uh, let's say a 14 year old who's extremely emotionally immature, um, always spends her appointments shouting at her mother for not doing this right, not doing that right, and, you know, really, really uh, behaving like a, what, on the face of it, would be like a very sort of spoiled approach in that her mother never challenges her, her mother never says, no, that's not right, dear. She, she just sort of stands there, never brushes her teeth, falls into the category of uh, people who um, uh, there's, this, there's these three categories of people that won't take your advice and uh, this is um, very apposite when it comes to staff there, there are people who don't know what you want them to do and that's why they're not doing it because they just don't want to know that they, you want them to do that um, there are people who they do know what you want them to do but they don't have the training or the materials or the equipment to do it and that's why they're not doing it. They want to do it, but there's something stopping them. Like, you know, like you've got a manager, but you haven't given them a laptop or whatever. And then the third category is people who do know what you want them to do and who have got all the resources necessary to do it, but have chosen for reasons of their own that, to do something different. <clears throat> and um, this is very... Uh, well, as I say with staff because staff in that third category you just have to get rid of them you can't honestly you can't uh, tolerate people with their own agendas um, and uh, we had a <laughs> we had a receptionist who was a uh, classic uh, manifestation of this uh, because she used to write all the notes in uppercase and uh, I asked her to not to write all the notes in uppercase there was no reason to, you know, she had a caps key. <laughs> and, um, and she just carried on doing it. 
and uh, again, you know, I she uh, used to write the uh, patient surname in uppercase all the time, which I, I, there is a practice. There is some there is some reason to do that because um, you know sometimes with foreign names in particular, it's not clear which is the first name, which is the last name. However, on our computer, we have a first name and last night name uh, data field, so it, it wasn't necessary. And um, and other stupid things like uh, she used to double lock all the doors. We have our internal doors have got these dead bolts on them, and she used to double lock all the the, the doors. Now. Anyone who's broken into the building and then wants to break into the surgery is through an internal door, which is first of all dumb because that's the most difficult way to break into our place. And secondly, uh, it just meant that all the staff, when they came to unlock the doors, unlock, unlocked it once and then tried the handle and found that it was still locked. And so they had to unlock it again, which it sounds like a small thing, but I said, look, we, there's no need to double deadlock these doors. Can we just all agree just to lock them once? And then when we unlock them and open the door, they'll open. Uh, but she, um, not only did she disagree with this, I think on the grounds that she thought that it was less secure and that she wasn't going to get burgled on her watch, so she's going to carry on double deadlocking everything. But also, um, it was like a tacit, defiance you know it was like a passive resistance it was something that she could do that I never caught her doing and uh, and she knew it annoyed me and uh, so that's why she did it because she liked it because she knew she was annoying me by doing it and that's as a as a member of staff that let me just tell you that is never a good idea it is never a good idea to do something that you know annoys the boss because he can't catch you doing it or he can't prove that you did it. It's just because dental surgeries are so small that <laughs> there's never ever going to be any doubt about who was doing it. It's just a case of what the boss is going to do as a result. And, then, and as a result, we made her job redundant. So, back to the subjects of children's dentistry. So, patients who don't brush their teeth. Well, some of them, uh, most of them fall under the category of, they know what they need to do, but they, they really haven't been given the tools to do it. So that's just a short lesson in brushing, plus uh, using plaque scosing tablets so that they can spot where the plaque is, right? And then, you get the patients who you show them how to brush their teeth and they come back and the teeth are no better. So you show them again and then they come back and the teeth are no better. And this can come back, you can do this over several years, uh, this can happen. And the teeth are never any better. And you think, why am I not having an impact on this patient? Why are they not? Where, where, where is the disconnect between what I want them to do and what they're actually doing? And almost always you find that it's, it, with a child for example, it's because you've got no support from the parents. Uh, what will happen is that you'll get them in and you'll say, you know, look, there's an uh, eight year old child or something and their teeth are coming in plant, you say to the parents, look, the, this child is too young to either take responsibility or to uh, check or uh, have the manual dexterity necessary to brush their teeth. So I would like you, not every day, I'd just like you to assume some more responsibility in terms of making sure this job gets done because it's important. And that that then cues this sort of this stupid debate between the parent and the child where the parent says, I told you to brush your teeth, you told me you'll brush your teeth this morning. What's the meaning of this? And like you're not, you know what's happened is you've just devolved responsibility to the parents and they've immediately devolved it back down again to the child is what you've just said shouldn't happen so you say look I'm going to in effect now and I've written letters to patients to, uh, this, uh, to this extent saying I, I, you know I hold you responsible for this you are uh, I want you to check their teeth from time to time with the disclosing tablets and then uh, sometimes you get no response and then um, 
but I've, I've had to say to patients very rarely, look, I think you need to see another dentist because this de another dentist may have may be able to uh, communicate better what is required in terms of treatment because I'm, I'm failing at this. Um, and uh, you don't want to do that, but I think what happens then is that the shock of being, uh, in effect, transferred out may cause a light bulb to come on in the parent's mind and uh, that, that they can't just ignore this problem as they have been doing for years up to now. You know. Anyway, um, this 14-year-old, uh, uh, she had a decayed lower right six and um, it was not... Uh, I mean, ideally, I know if you take out a lower six, it's not ideal. If you take out a uh, lower six, you should take out both lower sixes. But at the moment, just getting this one decayed lower six out was is, is, is an objective, you know. And uh, perhaps her uh, seven and eight will move forwards, and on the left-hand side, she can have her eight out. And she might have some semblance of a decent occlusion, because you can't, you know, you mustn't let the what's achievable good being be the enemy of the of the perfect or whatever don't let the perfect oh I don't know anyway it's the same so the main thing is she doesn't have this big decay anyway we got it out in the end we got it out it was it, was, it wasn't a difficult extraction 14 year olds are pretty easy they got pretty pliable bone and if you get some one of these um, cow horns on on any tooth lower tooth that's got some sort of bifurcation then believe me the forceps are not going to leave the mouth without the tooth attached so uh, that all's well that ends well in that case but again another another challenge we always tend to see our children first thing in the morning because uh, it's uh, the child is has less time to sit on it all day the um, dentist is a, bit, is a bit more refreshed in the morning there's nothing worse than I mean this is why the schools chuck the kids out at half past three because they're absolutely unteachable at that point they're good for nothing and uh, you put a fractious child that's been at school all day <coughs> in with a fractious dentist and uh, <coughs> excuse me hello Marcus sitting in a tree. And uh, it's a recipe for disaster. So anyway, there's a few pointers on children's dentistry for you. Okay, it's okay. Providing you uh, you know what you know what you can do and you do what you know, you know you can do, you know. What you can know, what you know, what do you know, what do you know? Alright, I'll see you later. Bye.